John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, um, and we read the CSB version. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace that you've poured out so abundantly upon our lives. And we thank you for your word through which you have revealed yourself to us that we may know you and love you and obey you and worship you. So Father, I pray that this morning you would speak to every single one of us through your word. And I pray that uh, that your spirit would work in every heart, in every life to bring conviction of sin and righteousness and, and stir love and affection for you. So we thank you, God. We um, just invite you to reign and rule among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, Over at Holland Park, we recently went through a sermon series in the evening services where we went through the seven I am statements of Jesus as uh, as recorded in John's gospel. Um, So throughout Jesus' ministry, he made a number of these uh, declarations. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And today we're going to be looking at this last one. Um, Just so that we're all familiar with the the context of this passage, John 15 is is what we're looking at. John 15, verse 1 to 8 for today. Uh, John 15 is is part of what's known as the farewell discourse of Jesus. This is his last words to his disciples before uh, before he died. Um, His disciples didn't know it at the time, but in just a few hours after saying these words, he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be arrested, tortured, and put to death on the cross. So his disciples didn't know it, but they knew something was going on because Jesus has been talking strangely all night. So earlier in the evening, Jesus shared a meal. It was the night of the Passover. He shared a meal with his disciples. It's the famous Last Supper. And during the meal, Jesus starts to say some strange things. He tells his 12 disciples that one of them is going to betray him. And then he tells his disciples that he's going away, and where he's going, they can't follow him just yet. And that gets them really worried. They have lots of questions for him. So he reassures them by telling them that they won't be alone. When Jesus goes to his Father, he's going to send them a helper, the Holy Spirit, to teach them and remind them of everything that Jesus has told them. After this, they leave the house and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. There Jesus will pray, his disciples will fall asleep, and Judas will soon arrive with the soldiers to arrest Jesus. Now, on the way to the garden is is where this conversation tonight takes place. Jesus speaks these words. He knows he's leaving soon to the cross and then back to the Father. And he's preparing them for life without him. He gives them one key principle to live by as they as they strive to live fruitful Christian lives, waiting for him to return. And that key principle is going to be the main point for today's message, and it's this. Remain in Christ, and you will bear fruit. Now, Jesus fleshes this out through the metaphor of the vine, the gardener, and the branches. Um, There's a lot that he talks about. In fact, this whole chapter has so much riches. We're just going to focus on these three roles today. Um, what he says about these three roles. The vine provides, the gardener prunes, and the branches produce. 
right, with regards to fruitfulness. Now, let's first look at what Jesus says about himself, the vine. Uh, he says in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus makes a number of these I am statements throughout his ministry. Right? The Apostle John highlights them throughout his gospel. Seven times he says it, followed by a metaphor, I am the the true vine, as today's passage. There's also other occasions in John's gospel that he records Jesus making a declaration, I am, just by itself. For example, uh, when he was speaking to a crowd of Jews in John chapter 8, and he tells them, Abraham, your ancestor rejoiced to see my day. And they scoffed. They said, whatever, you're not even 50 years old. How can you say that you've seen Abraham? And then Jesus makes this staggering claim. He says, before Abraham was, I am. All right, so whenever Jesus makes one of these declarations, he's actually claiming for himself the name of God. He's, he's claiming that he is the one true God of the universe. And why do I say this? Well, this is because in Exodus, when God called Moses to lead his people out of slavery from Egypt, Moses asked God, what should I say your name is? What should I, who should I tell the people who has sent me? And God says to him, I am who I am. Tell the people I am has sent you. And so I am is, 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 is God's explanation of what his name means. And so any Jew would instantly recognize the implications of what Jesus is saying. right? It, it, Jesus is claiming to be God. And we know they picked up on this because in some of the examples in John's gospel where Jesus is making this claim publicly, like in chapter 8, where we saw, he, he said, before Abraham was, I am. The Jews picked up rocks to, to throw and kill him because they, they knew he was claiming to be God, and that's blasphemy for a, if a mere man was making such a claim. So the very first thing we see from this opening statement is that Jesus is the eternal God. He is the creator of and the author of life. And this isn't immediately obvious to us, but was clear to all those who were listening to him. But there's something else in this passage that's also not clear to us today, but would have been immediately obvious to a first century Jew, and that's the metaphor of the vine. You see, the vine was something like a national symbol for Israel at this time. We've got national symbols in our day, right? Icons and images that just represent a people or a nation. Uh, for example, if I put these pictures on the screen, if I showed just a random person these images, I would uh, wager most people would immediately recognize what they are, but also think of a nation associated with these images. The vine was this kind of a symbol for Israel at this time. Uh, during the New Testament days, on the coins that they use in Israel, it often had a vine engraved on one side. Uh, and, and at the entrance to the to the temple sanctuary, there were these massive pillars, multi-story high pillars, and around them were entwined solid gold vines, huge vines. The, the, it's written uh, by some historians, the clusters of gold grapes were as big as a, an adult man. Right? So this is, this is a symbol that represents the nation of Israel. I've got a picture on here. I found some uh, archaeologists made a model of what, that, what the vine around the temple entrance looks like. Um, it's a bit bright to see. <laughs> now, this is because throughout the Old Testament, the vine imagery was often used, Israel was often referred to as God's vine. Right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Psalms, and others, they all have significant portions devoted to this vine metaphor. Uh, for example, in Isaiah 5, it gives us what's known as the vineyard song. Uh, the opening verses say, The one I love had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He broke up the soil, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it and even dug out a wine press there. He expected it to yield good grapes, but it yielded worthless grapes. And it's worth noting that almost every time the Old Testament uses this vine metaphor, it's, it's used in a, a negative sense, in a sense of judgment. Right, it's a declaration of judgment upon Israel for failing to produce fruit, being a worthless vine. And Isaiah, in, in fact, in chapter 5, goes on, God goes on to say that so this, this vineyard would be, 
will be torn down and destroyed. The gates, will, the, the fences will be broken down. So when Jesus here declares not only that he is the vine, but he is the true vine, he is making a contrast between himself and the false vine, the worthless vine, faithless and fruitless Israel. He's saying, I am the true Israel. Where Israel had failed, I will not. I am the fruitful vine that will bear real and lasting fruit for the Father. See, if you want to be connected to God, the Jews would say you have to be a part of Israel. You have to be connected to the covenant people of God. But Jesus is saying here, no, no, no. Being connected to the nation of Israel is to be connected to a false vine. If you want to be connected to God, you must be connected to me. It's through Jesus and Him alone that life comes. Through Him alone that all of God's blessings come. The vine provides the life, the energy, the nourishment without which a branch can do nothing. It's dead and useless. So the question is, are you connected to Jesus? Right, he goes on to say in verse 2, Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit, so that it will produce more fruit. We'll focus on what the Father does in a moment, but for now I just want to point out Jesus talks about two kinds of branches. Both appear to be connected to the vine, but not really. Uh, one type of branch has no life. It only has the appearance of being connected to the vine, but we know it's not connected to the life of the vine because it bears no fruit. Now, in the context of the Passover night, if you just put yourself in the shoes of the disciples listening to this, one of the things that has to be on their mind is what Jesus told them earlier that night. One of them is a traitor. One of them is a branch that by all appearances is connected to the vine, but, but it had no life. You can't tell at looking at outward appearances. No one knew who it was. No one knew it was Judas. Everyone was wondering, is it me? Is it me? Judas followed Jesus around for three years. He took part in his ministry. He was a trusted member of the group, so much that he was, uh, he was the treasurer. He took charge of the money for the group. But he was a dead branch that bore no fruit and will be cut off. And so the, here's the question again. Are you truly connected to Jesus? Are you vitally connected to Jesus? Because you can look like you're connected to him. You can think that you are connected to Him, but if you are not vitally connected to Him, if you're not drawing life and sustenance and energy from Him, try it as you might. You will not bear genuine fruit. So what is this fruit that we are to bear? Well, some of us might think of internal things like, uh, like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Uh, some of us might think of external things like evangelism, winning souls, making converts, uh, doing ministry. Now, Jesus never points out a specific thing as, as fruit. He, he does say in verse 8, My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So the fruit that Jesus is talking about both glorifies God and uh, is the evidence of genuine saving faith. And I want to come back to this later on, but for now I would just say I think the fruit Jesus refers to can't be narrowed down to any particular thing, but it's the sum total of the Christian life that brings glory to God. It's righteous attitudes, thoughts, motivations, character, speech, actions, behavior, all of which spring out of a genuine relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the vine is the one that provides the life to the branches to bear this fruit. And without that vital connection, a branch can do nothing. He says this again in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because without me, because you can do nothing without me. The first thing then that we need to remember about living the fruitful Christian life is that Jesus is the source. He's the great I am. He is God in the flesh. Through him alone flows the life that enables every branch connected to him to bear fruit. Jesus is the center and the essence of the Christian life. To be a Christian is to know Christ, to obey Christ, to be connected to Christ, to worship Christ. 
It's the essence of the Christian life is not church or ministry or theology or ritual or religion. It's Christ. If you have Christ, you have everything that you need. And if you don't have Christ, nothing else you have will ever be enough. So that's the vine. The vine is the source. He's, he provides everything. Let's now look at what Jesus tells us about the gardener, who is the father. Jesus says, My father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit, so that it will produce more fruit. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now God the Father is is portrayed here as an attentive gardener who tends to his vine to make sure that it will produce fruit. Uh, I assume there's many of you here who enjoy gardening. Uh, I have to be honest, that's not me. Um, I can barely be motivated to mow the lawn regularly. Usually it's only because we know someone's visiting. Um, Years ago, uh, my wife and I tried to set up a garden bed and grow some vegetables in the backyard. We, We set up a raised garden bed. We planted an assortment of vegetables. Um, But sad to say, after about a week, uh, we kind of lost motivation, right? The enthusiasm wore off, and and watching plant grow for us was a little bit boring. Um, I I don't want to offend people, because last time I said this, someone came up to me after service and said, it's amazing watching plant grow. Uh, It's just not something, you know, I really got into. Um, so things got neglected, things were malnourished, there were bugs all over the, the plants, and eventually some of them did actually bear fruit, but it didn't look appealing to eat at all. Um, it's a good thing that's not the father's attitude towards his prized vine. Right? He's, he wants the vine to flourish and all its branches to be filled with fruit, and so he tends to it. And Jesus tells us that the father does two things. He... Uh, he cuts off and removes the fruitless branches, and he prunes every fruitful branch so that it would increase in fruitfulness. Now, we've already talked about who the fruitless branches are. They're those who have no real life-giving connection with Jesus. They're those who have the appearance of being connected. Right? They come to church regularly. They know all the songs. They might even serve in some ministries, but they don't know Christ. They have not put their faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins. They have not surrendered their life to Jesus. They don't walk in obedience to Him in their lives. When the stakes are real, they always choose worldly gains and sinful pleasure over following Jesus. And Jesus says the Father will cut them off and remove them. In fact, later again in verse 6, Jesus says, If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they're burned. There is no escape from the judgment of God for anyone unless they are found in Christ, connected to the true vine. And so the message to anyone who knows they're not connected to Jesus is simple. Come to him and live Plug into the true vine so that you won't be cut off. If you don't know Jesus today, I implore you, put your faith in Him alone. Trust that because Jesus paid the penalty for sin, you can be forgiven by God. Have a relationship with Him. Be connected to the real source of life and fruit. But what if you know you are connected to the vine, but you still often have doubts? Like me, I I often have doubts. You might question after often as I do, am I really a fruitful branch? I mean, I do a lot of Christian things, but am I really vitally connected to Jesus? I suspect all of the 11 disciples would have had the same question in their mind as Jesus was saying these things. And I think that's why Jesus said what he said in verse 3, to assure them and to assure us. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now, it's not immediately clear from uh, English translations how cleaning relates to pruning and cutting and how this is all uh, related. I think it's possible to work it out, but, but it's more obvious uh, to, in the Greek. So I just want to briefly highlight this. There's a, play, there's a play on words in verses 2 and 3. Uh, so the word for remove, prune, and clean, they're all related to each other. Right, so the word for remove or cut off is ire, 
And the word for prune is kathire. So if you think about it like this, verse 2 is almost like a rhyme, right? Jesus, is, Jesus picked his wording to make it impactful and memorable. So the equivalent in English, I was thinking, could go something like this. The fruitless branches he throws and the fruitful branches he grows, right? You know, those kind of lingos that make it easy to, memory, to remember. Uh, but also notice the word for clean in verse 3 is Katharoi. It's, it's actually a very closely related word to the word prune. So, uh, in fact, uh, prune sometimes can be uh, translated cleanse. It's where we get the English word catharsis. Um, so, I think the thrust of these statements is something like this. Every fruitless branch the Father will remove, and every fruitful branch He will prune clean. And if you're worried about what kind of branch you are, take heart. You're already being pruned clean. Why? Because of the word I have spoken to you. Because you have already received and believed my word. So today, if, you're, if you have doubt about what kind of branch you are, the only question you need to ask yourself is this. Have you accepted the word of Jesus? Have you embraced the gospel message and believe in the good news that it brings? If you've put your trust in what the gospel teaches you will bear fruit. You might be at a place in your life where you feel like you have such small and inconsistent fruit. You're growing in character, but there's still a lot of flaws. You're trying to cultivate good biblical godly habits like reading your Bible and spending time with, uh, with God in prayer, but it just feels so hard and inconsistent. Take heart. Right? Any fruit you bear at all is only possible because you're connected to the vine. He has provided you with the fruit you bear, no matter how small it seems for now. And if you're connected to the vine, the Father will prune you in order that you bear more fruit. The process of pruning, however, it's not comfortable. It involves a knife. Right? Just to dwell on the gardening metaphor a bit, pruning a branch involves cutting away excess leaves, uh, cutting away uh, useless offshoots, uh, perhaps keeping the branch short so that it doesn't just get longer and longer. All of this is so that the energy and the nutrients in that branch could be focused towards producing fruit and not wasted. And this is what the Father does in our lives. He cuts away everything that hinders us from fruit bearing. Now, that definitely involves cutting away sin, but it could also involve cutting away things that are not so much sinful, but just wasteful and, and useless. Right, the cutting away of unnecessary baggage that saps our energy and attention and life and takes away from our ability to bear fruit. He might do that through loss. Loss of job, loss of material possessions, even loss of loved ones. He might do that through hardship. He might take on the form of sickness or suffering. He might prune you through failure and disappointment. There might be things that you have hoped for for a long time and you just don't quite seem to get what you want. He might prune you through persecution, through injustice being done to you. Now, I'm not saying that everything the Father does to sanctify and prune us is always going to be painful and hard, but let's be honest, very often it is, both emotionally and physically. Because let's think for a moment of the most life-defining moments you've had in your life. Think about the most important lessons you've learned, the most character-defining experiences. Were they not painful experiences? Were they not under the pruning knife of the Father? We don't usually grow in character through comfort and ease. We don't usually be compelled to lay down our idols when we have everything in comfort and plenty. It's precisely through trying times that we develop our most noble virtues. Pain alone, however, is only half the story, right? Everyone suffers painful experiences in this world. We're all sinners. It's a fallen world. Just because you suffer doesn't mean that you're being pruned or doesn't mean that you're going to grow and, and be more fruitful because of it. So what's, what's the other half? Well, we've already read it. Uh, we are clean because of God's word. Jesus points out the central role of God's word. Again, in verse 7, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. The word of God is the knife 
that God uses to prune us. The Word of God is what cuts to our hearts, what convicts us of our sin, what reveals to us righteousness. When you experience difficulties and sufferings, it's the Word of God that gives meaning to your pain. It's the Word of God that reveals how God is at work in your situation. The book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 4, verse 12, For the Word of God is living and and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So don't waste your suffering. Let it be an amplifier for the Word of God in your life. Let it... Let hardship drive you deeper into God's Word, to listen humbly, to submit joyfully, to see your own helplessness and cling tightly to the one who provides everything you need for life and fruitfulness. So finally, let's uh, let's turn our attention to the branches. That's, That's you and me. Jesus says, Remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. So what's a branch's role in all this? We know the branches are supposed to produce much fruit, but how are we supposed to produce this fruit? Well, the answer is by remaining in the vine. See, it's not the 10 steps to producing much fruit. It's not the seven traits of highly fruitful branches. It's, there's only one step, and that's to remain in the vine, be rightly connected to the vine. Now, that's probably not what we really want to hear. We want something more tangible. We want a set of steps, a, a, a checklist of things that we can do in order to say, yep, I've done all this, I am bearing fruit. And that's what most people naturally want. That's what all religions are about, right? We want a a list of things we have to do, and if we do them well and do them regularly, then we're right with God and we're fruitful. But that's, that's not Christianity. That's not what Jesus tells his disciples. These are his last words to him before his death, remember? This is what he wants them to remember when he's gone, and it's simply this, remain in him. Now, the command to remain, don't be mistaken, it's not passive. It's not as though he's saying, just stay where you are, right? Remain, don't, don't do anything, right? He's not, he's not saying that. Rather, remaining in him is a conscious, active, willful choice of obedience on our part. It's like if I told you, stay fit, right? And you might say, well, look, I'm, I'm pretty fit. I don't need to do anything. But we all know that's not how it works, right? Staying fit, you have to work at it. You have to be active in, in staying active, in exercising, in watching your diet, all those things. And life is not static. You're either growing stronger or you're getting weaker. You're either walking closer to God or you're drifting further away from Him, right? Remaining in Christ is not something that we just settle into on autopilot. It's a daily choice, to align our priorities and thoughts and actions towards Him. Some of you might be thinking, well, what does that look like? How how do I actively remain in Christ? I'll just share one simple principle that I want to suggest. Whatever fuels your love for God, whatever it is that stirs your affections towards Jesus, whatever motivates you to obey Him and love Him, get more of that in your life. It could be It could be events, it could be circumstances like going to to church camps and conferences. It could be putting on worship music in the background of your home. It could be listening to sermons on your way to school or work. It could be the people that you hang out with. Certain people just stir your faith. Get more of those situations and people in your life. And conversely, whatever turns your heart towards worldliness... Whatever tends to stir up sinful desires in your heart, as much as possible, remove those things from your life. It's going to look different for different people. You know, for example, in my life, there are some things I've found that I just don't know. I'm, I, my temperament just doesn't let me deal with in a healthy way. Many years ago, I tried for a while to uh, invest in the stock market, uh, to be an active trader. <laughs> um, I bought some shares and. And for months, I was completely unproductive in what I was actually supposed to do with my day. 
uh, I was just looking at prices on my computer all day. I kept clicking refresh on the charts. I was, and my mood was greatly affected. I was up when the prices were up. I was down when the prices were down. I, it got to a point where the daily fluctuations of, of the stock market was more important to me for my joy than God's word and his eternal truths. And I just had to stop. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not saying a Christian can't trade shares. I'm just saying I couldn't. But it wasn't a good thing for me. Now, one aspect of remaining in Christ then means recognizing those things in our lives that either help or hinder us from growing to know and love God. But for all of us, at least that means the basic spiritual disciplines of spending regular personal time in His Word, uh, praying and talking to God, spending time worshiping God both by yourself and with the church, right? having times of fellowship with brothers and sisters in the church, encouraging one another, being accountable to one another. If you're here and you're not connected to one of the community groups, if you don't know people in the church, come and talk to me afterwards. I, I know I'm not regular here, but I'd love to introduce you to Pastor Dave or to one of the elders here. I'm going to love to get you connected to one of the small groups here at this church. You see, earlier we talked about what fruitfulness means. And I mentioned that the fruit Jesus is talking about isn't a particular thing, but is the entirety of our lives. And I think there's a good reason why Jesus never pointed to any one thing and said, that's the fruit you need to bear. He didn't point at evangelism and say, that's fruitfulness. Make converts, right? win souls. He also didn't point to uh, serving the church or doing good works or giving financially or being a joyful and generous person. That's because being fruitful should be all of those things. But at the same time, I think it's possible to have all of those things and still not be fruitful in the way that Jesus is saying. And why do I say that? Well, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And he's specifically talking about fruit bearing. Or well, if you think with me for a moment, what is it that we can't do without Jesus? There's actually a lot of Christian things we can do apart from Christ. Right? You can be a nice person without Jesus. You can give money to the poor apart from Jesus. You can serve in the church apart from Jesus. You can even preach the gospel and make converts. You can even preach sermons and pastor a church despite not knowing Jesus personally. There's, there's a lot of things we can do on the outside without Jesus. If we focus on any particular measurable action as fruit, well, we can always fake it. Right, we can always attach the fruit artificially to the branch and call it fruitfulness. Uh, but it's not. It's not evidence of life. It's not going to last. It doesn't sustain. The fruit didn't come from life within. It's not, it's not organic growth. On the other hand, if we wholeheartedly seek Christ, if we delight in Him, seek to know Him, to be in communion with Him, to have our hearts and lives be saturated by His Word, to remain in Him, we will bear all the fruits that He's designed us to bear. If you're walking closely and joyfully with Jesus, you're going to naturally want to tell people about Him. You're going to want to love your fellow Christians and serve God's church, and you'll be glad to give generously when you are saturated with just how generous God is with you. But that's not to say that any of this will just suddenly become easy, or it won't still require effort or will but you're going to do so in the power of God. The true vine provides the spiritual life that manifests itself in you as the various kinds of fruit. The one thing you need as a branch is to remain in Him. Now, I know I mentioned earlier that I don't have a green thumb. Uh, I don't have much interest in growing things, and I don't have much success either, but I thought I should try to give my kids some positive learning experiences about gardening. Maybe they'll like it more than me. So my daughter's three. Uh, on Father's Day, a couple of months ago, I took her to Bunnings, and we bought this seed planting kit, and we planted some seeds. Uh, after a week or so, they started sprouting up, and I took this picture in my living room. Um, so it, it, we, we had a, a good start after a week. Um, I won't tell you what happened uh, now. Um, <laughs> But one interesting I want to point out uh, that I observed with my daughter is that they're all crooked, they're all, they're all bent, but they're all bending the same way, right? And for any of you who's grown 
things um, in your house before, you know that it's because we put them next to the window. And uh, they're all bending towards the window because that's where the sun is. See, plants are really quite simple. They just, wherever the source of life and energy is, they'll just keep growing towards that. Right? Wherever there's nutrients and nourishment in the earth, they'll just dig down their roots to find it. And wherever the sun is in the sky, they'll just keep stretching out towards it all day long. And that's what we need to do to be fruitful. Wherever the sun is, seek Him out. Remain in the true vine. Delight in Him. Obey Him. Worship Him. And the fruit will be the natural outcome of your life. Fruit that pleases and glorifies God. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. We thank you that you've given us your son. You put him on the cross to take our place. Though we deserved nothing but your wrath, you've given us nothing but grace. And we pray, Lord, that every day you would remind us of this glorious truth. Father, help us to see in our lives the one thing that is truly most important, and that is Christ. Move our hearts and our affections that we would love Him above all else. Father, we ask that you would help us to recognize the things in our lives that we need to cut off, the things that you are working through in us to prune us. Help us to recognize in the midst of difficulty and pain what you are doing in our lives. And we pray, God, that we may submit joyfully and wholeheartedly to you to remain in Christ, to allow you to work that work of cleansing and pruning in us, that we may bear much fruit, that you may be glorified in everything that we do. And so we thank you and praise you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.